So, in honor of the memory of the late Robert M. Hardy, known to many as Bob Hardy, the Society instituted in 1987 an award to form a keynote address given at the beginning of the annual Canadian Geotechnical Conference. Bob Hardy played a major role in the development of Canadian geotechnology, particularly in Western Canada. The topic of his address is decided jointly by, a select, by the selected speaker, a selection uh, committee consisting of members of the local geotechnical group, plus the vice president technical of the society. I would like to invite Mustafa first to give the address in French, and then Alex to introduce our speaker. Thank you, Andrea. En l'honneur et à la mémoire de, du défunt Robert M. Hardy, connu de plusieurs comme Bob Hardy, la société a institué en 1987 un prix sous la forme d'une allocution inaugurale de la conférence annuelle de la Société canadienne de géotechnique. Bob Hardy a joué un rôle majeur dans le développement de la géotechnique canadienne, particulièrement dans l'Ouest canadien. Le sujet de la conférence Hardy est décidé conjointement par le conférencier sélectionné, un comité de sélection composé de membres du groupe local de géotechnique, ainsi que le vice-président technique de la société. Je voudrais inviter Alexis à présenter le conférencier. Good morning. I'm Alex C. I'm very pleased to introduce my longtime and esteemed colleague, Harvey McLeod, who will present the 2016 R.M. Hardy keynote address. Harvey graduated in 1973 with a Bachelor of Applied Science in Geological Engineering from the University of British Columbia. He worked for two years with CBA Engineering in Vancouver before joining Clone Leonov in 1976, which later became Clone Quipman Berger, where he's been ever since. Harvey took a leave in 1980 to complete a diploma from Imperial College of the University of London in soil mechanics. Over his 40-year career, Harvey has worked on more than 100 tailing stands in over 20 countries. He has been a leader in the evolution and development of mine tailings management practices. He is currently chair of the International Commission of Large Stamps, I call Subcommittee on Tailing Stamps, and is active in the Canadian Dam Association. He has authored more than 20 technical papers. He was one of the primary authors of the Association of Professional Engineers and Geoscientists of British Columbia's Professional Practice Guidelines on Legislated Dam Safety Reviews in BC, which was published in 2014, and the hot of the press, site characterization for dam foundations in BC. This latter, a PEC BC publication, is in direct response to the Mount Polly mine tailings breach. In addition to the expertise he has developed in the scientific and engineering aspects of mine waste, Harvey has championed the integration of social environmental responsibility with the engineered aspects of tailings and waste rock. Harvey was a recipient of the 2013 Association of Mineral Explorations Robert R. Hadley Award for Excellence in Social and Environmental Sustainability. Recently, Harvey has been supporting the BC Ministry of Energy and Mines 
with its investigation into the August 2014 Mount Polly tailing stem failure, and is working with various industry associations to incorporate lessons learned from Mount Polly into practice and to improve guidelines and regulations for tailing stems. In line with the history and innovation theme of this conference, Harvey's lecture is on the history of tailing stem design and innovation and practice changes required in the wake of the Mount Pauly mine tailings breach. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Harvey McLeod to give this year's R.M. Hardy keynote address. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, fellow colleagues, um, and thanks very much for a kind introduction, Alex. It's a great honor to be able to give this talk to you today, and um, I hope you enjoy it as much as I've enjoyed my 42-year career. The talk I'm going to cover, give you a brief history of mining in British Columbia, and then get into the evolution of soil mechanics, because the the design of tailing dams is based on soil mechanic principles. It's sound engineering is the basis for good tailing dam design. And just walk you through the, both the um, academic and engineering development as we moved into design of dams and construction of dams, moving in today where we have guidelines and technologies for dams. And I'll give an overview of the Mount Pauly failure and give you some of the lessons learned out of Mount Pauly and some of the practice changes that have been emerging. Now mining in British Columbia, it actually started I think around in the 1850s with coal mining in Nanaimo. And then the Barkerville the gold rush, you've all heard about that. And most of these mines were high grade underground mines. Um, a lot of mines in southeast, um, southern Kootenays of massive sulfide mines. And the first mines inspector was actually appointed, I think, in the 1880s. And you can see the one picture there is Britannia. There's, it's now a museum out there. It was opened, I think, in 1901. And at that time, it was the largest copper producer in the British Empire. And as a student, I remember going there, uh, a tour there in the 60s, late 60s. And they had these stalactites hanging from the ceiling of the mill that you see there. There were stalactites of azurite and malachite that were something like 15 or 20 feet long hanging from the ceiling of the mill building. I still wonder what happened to those. Uh, sort of the next stage in mining happened, you know, during the war. In between the war effort, there was um, Pinchy Creek up in um, north of Fort St. James where they were mining um, uh, mercury. And actually, on my, my first project in the late 60s on exploration geology north of Kamloops at Birch Island, they were mining uranium. You can still see the remnants of the old cables in the hillside that we were doing the geophysical surveys on. And then after the war, certainly the southeast coal area started opening up. And the big change was the advent of the porphyry or the development of porphyry copper deposits. You know, before that, most mines were relatively small tonnage, but these large porphyry copper deposits, they're tens or hundreds of thousands of tons per day. And that came about with the development of new mining equipment. And there's a whole string of porphyry copper deposits starting in the south from um, Copper Mountain to Highland Valley Copper to Afton to Gibraltar to Mount Pauly to Equity Silver and up north to Morrison to, um, uh, there's probably something like 20 major copper porphyry deposits. And in parallel with that, certainly a lot of gold mining developments. So the next part of my talk, I just want to give sort of a, an overview of the history of soil mechanics. It actually started in probably the 1400s with Leonardo da Vinci exploring uh, frictional resistance of materials. But it really wasn't until Moore, Christian Moore in 1882, developing the 2D stress states and Moore circles that we use today. And I guess my favorite one is Henry Darcy with Q equals KIA. 
And like all of us, when you get flummoxed by fee flow and mod flow and fancy um, hydrogeological models, Q equals KIA has been an invaluable in my career. Yeah, but it was a Scotsman, William Rankin, who developed theories of lateral earth pressures. And the British Geotechnical Society has an honorary lecture called the Rankin Lecture. And coincidentally, my classmate from Imperial College has been giving that lecture this year. So we've got two of our, two of our graduating class giving important lectures this year. But it wasn't just um, you know, some development in, in academic. It was also just the engineering. And I was in Boston last year that my daughter, my daughter was running in the marathon. And I picked up this book at the Harvard bookstore, and it was on tunneling in Boston, and came across this story. Uh, William Parsons, who's now, uh, you know, you know Parsons Brinkerhoff, the engineering company, he developed a method where, um, you know, they wanted to drive the subways in bedrock. So he pounded a two-inch steel pipe into the ground till he hit refusal. And then he went inside with a one-inch pipe and took samples every five feet. Sounds a bit like what we do today. Um, the next major developments was uh, Carl, uh, Swedish um, Albert Atterberg, and certainly um, Atterberg limits and the understanding of clays, that's really where it started. But it really was Carl Terzaghi, who in the 30s started putting some of these pieces together. And then after the war, him along with Ralph Peck um, put together the, the famous textbook, Principles of so Introduction of Soil Mechanics. And it was the second edition of that, that's the one that in my that as university student um, was my um, textbook. And, but there are other element, other areas, Imperial College with uh, Sir Alex Skempton and Alan Bishop developing the theories of effective stress and Skempton A parameter. And in University of California with Dr. Harry Seed, who's known as the father of earthquake engineering. And Charles or Chuck Ladd of MIT and undrained shear strain. So, in these academic pockets, you were getting the elements of soil mechanics that we use today. But engineering practice, it wasn't all academic. The engineering practice was moving along. And a lot of it came after the Second World War with the US Army Corps of Engineers and the US Bureau of Land Reclamation and Management. And certainly, their, their books and their guides were important guidelines and, and studies that I used in my early dam design career. But the Canadian development probably started first um, with Carl Terzaghi and uh, Charlie Ripley, who was one of the original founders of our company, and looking at um, working with, at that time, uh, BC Electric, which is now BC Hydro. And you all may have heard of the Terzaghi Dam just north of, um, north of here. Um, he started putting together the theories, and actually he was our first review board, or the first review engineer on, on a major dam in British Columbia. But I just wanted to share with you a couple of, of uh, truisms, if you like, that he passed on to Charlie Ripley, and they're in Charlie Ripley's um, paper. The sooner you get to the truth of a problem and the situation, the better for you and your client. And that's really the essence of, of engineering, is understanding what the problem is and getting clarity on the problem so you can develop a clear solution. And the second one, if your answer is too complicated, it's probably wrong. And certainly in tailing dams, making the tailing dam complicated has been a concern of mine over the years. You know, people try and get too clever with dams, and sometimes simpler and more robust is better. And uh, engineering arm hardy, this lecture is in his honor. He pioneered the um, design of uh, oil sand tailing dams in northern engineering. And he was a key player in development of the engineering of soil mechanics applied to dams. Fred Maddich, who I understand, is, is here today um, with Geocon, which is now into SNC-Lavalin. He probably had what I would call the first application of soil mechanics to an engineering assessment of an upstream tailings dam. This was at Copper Cliff in 1956. And that was with Casa Grande. Actually, this photo on the left here that you see there, that's um, Bob Hardy and uh, Arthur Casa Grande. So Casa Grande was, was influencing both in Eastern Canada and Western Canada. 
And I couldn't get the picture, but one of my uh, colleagues, he says, well, his memory of Bob Hardy were, were two things. One is he's always smoking a big cigar, and the other one is a pen knife that he was always looking at soil. So he was a remarkable engineer. Now in the early 60s, uh, Chuck Rahner and Hugh Golder, which is now known as Golder Associates, uh, started building the coarse refuse dams in the southeast coal area. And then in the 80s, uh, Knight and Peasel from South Africa came in at developing the or introducing subaerial deposition, and Stefan Robson Kirsten, SRK, introducing acid rock drainage and uh, the implications for environmental aspects of tailing facilities. But up until the 1960s, you know, most of these dams were, were not that engineered. They were basically just spigoting tailings upstream to form a structure. That first picture there, you can see they, they placed some boards and just spigot tailings until uh, the tailings level came up to the top of the boards and then they'd let it dry and then move, move in. And you can see these similar structures in China today, even in high seismic areas. But probably, actually I have to mention, the first compacted downstream tailings dam that I could find was in Pennsylvania in 1956 where they were using a dozer to compact the coarse refuse coal, which is the coarser parts of the coal uh, to form the dam and the fine tailings would have been behind it. But it was really Earl Clone who in the mid-60s, in response to this need for engineered dams, in response to the need for high dams to store these large porphyry copper tailing deposits, uh, developed what we call the center line cyclone sand dams, where basically you're taking the sand out of the tailings to build a structure. And these structures that were built 40, 50 years ago, they still meet today's standards and are very robust. But design sections for tailing dams are all different. Uh, we mine many different types of tailings from very fine in the oil sands to very coarse materials. Uh, your different geological, different climatic, different physiographic conditions. So every dam is different, which makes it interesting. So I'm just gonna relate a few, um, few uh, dams over the years. In the 60s, this was a Brenda mine that I mentioned. It was basically all out of cyclone sand. So it's really just a big sand pile when you get down to it. And down at the bottom there, the photo is how it looks today. It's, it's been closed as a, as, a, um, as a drained pile of, of sand. I call it a pile of sand. It, it is a dam. Uh, this one, and this was the first project I worked on, and this, this gave me an introduction into um, into the vagaries of the, ge of the uh, geological, geomorphological history in, in uh, British Columbia with the glaciers. Uh, this is the Afton project. Uh, and just to relate to you, when we we're constructing the dam, we, we um, had to excavate down about 15 meters through some recent lacustrine soils to get to what we thought was a nice uh, impervious glacial till, very dense glacial till. And uh, that was one of my first projects with our company. And we were down um, at the bottom of the core trench. We are ready to start placing fill to go back in. And the next push of the dozer, what does it reveal? Open work cobbles. Well, <laughs> I think any dam person would say, I don't want open work cobbles in the foundation of my dam. Uh, so it was a quick phone call to Mark Olson in the office and and this is where your senior people have to earn their money. Um, fortunately, it was concluded it, it was unlikely to be hydraulically connected to the tailings pond, and we proceeded, and, and life is fine. But uh, the history of mining is mines start, and metal prices go down, they die, and they resurrect, and metal prices come back up. So here they um, reopened, new, called New Afton, the now block caving. And um, I've put this dam in. You can see a geomembrane in the face there. And this is basically a centerline core dam with the geomembrane zigzagged up the center of the core and with cyclone sand on the upstream and downstream side, which, in my opinion, is, is a good, robust design. Uh, the SNP mine, there was a lot of, in the 80s, gold prices went up and the SNP gold mine in northwest BC. This project, we had to go in and do dynamic compaction by flying in the, flying in the weights and the, 
and the crane by helicopter with the big Sikorskys and sheep pile cutoff wall for control of the cyanide. And on the right there, you can see the photograph of how it looks today. One interesting innovation there was the spillway. Uh, we had a dam failure in Metachewan in Ontario in the 90s caused by a beaver building a, a dam in the spillway. So I jokingly say we have to design for the MPB, which is the maximum probable beaver. <laughs> and in that case, we, we basically built a flow through spillway where it's, it's a rock fill, infill spillway. So it just discourages the beaver from building a dam. <clears throat> this one in the 90s, a coal mine. Coal was a hot topic then. Uh, it's a flow-through dam built out of mine, mine uh, waste rock, and the fine tailings are placed in, and they exfiltrate through the coarse uh, dam, and then they're collected at the toe of the dam and, and recycled back to the process plant. And uh, one of my first lining projects, Greenwood Gold, replacing the LLDP liner there. But there's a lot of tailing dam design and guidelines. The ICOL committee, it started, um, I think, in 1989. And since then, there have been a, a lot of bulletins on tailing dam design. Uh, we mentioned the, the Canadian Dam Association. I have to give credit to the Canadian Dam Association because it's, I think, one of the few um, uh, sort of um, country members of ICOL that pays a lot of attention to tailing dams. And, in the conferences, tailing dams are treated the same as water dams, which in my opinion they should be. They're major civil engineering structures and should have the same design and respect as a water dam. But in a lot of countries, they're still relegated as the, as the poor second cousin. And the um, Mining Association of Canada has excellent guidelines. A lot of them were developed after the O-Mine Las Frelias failures. Uh, and you have man or it's more along the management aspects, not the technical aspects. So some people ask me, well, what is a good tailings dam design? What are the elements of a good design? And it's really not that complicated, that hard, even though it often gets complicated. It's, um, you have to have a good structural shell zone and, and, and I do prefer centerline dams because of conservation of materials. But you need a good structural sh shell zone, which in this figure here is the green area. Now, when you build an upstream zone, you don't have all those zones. You're just placing spigoted tailings. So you're developing a material or placing a material which you're not 100% sure of its geotechnical properties. You don't have the same level of quality control or quality concerns over a upstream spigoted dam as you would over an engineered structure. So we tend to shy away from, from the upstream dams, although we have structures where we actually compact the sand as we're spigoting it upstream, and that basically gives you the equivalent of a, of a um, shell or constructed shell dam that you require for stability. But one of the elements that um, over the years I've, I've learned is that the tailings should help you. The tailings can be used to reduce your hydraulic gradients and give you a safer dam. And in my opinion, the, the tailings should always be placed next to the core zone. You'll see some dams where it may have a central core with a rock fill zone upstream. You'll have some dams where the raising of the core, the upstream is using rock fill to support the upstream core. And if you think about the difference between having a rock fill zone upstream versus having tailings upstream. The rock fill zone is transmitting full hydraulic head and a source of water so that if you get um, settlement fractures, you've got a high pressure hydraulic fracturing, more water would go through the core and exacerbate piping. So we always try and have the tailings adjacent to our core zone to try and mitigate and reduce the likelihood of, of piping and to reduce the hydraulic gradients. Uh, the other area of, of, of important uh, to me over the years has been liners, and there's a lot of mythology about liners out there. You'll read articles where they last 72.3 years, and they have these properties, and some people like them, and some people hate them. Um, 
Just recently, we've been carrying out collaborative research with Queen's University and Dr. Kerry Rowe, uh, who they have the largest geomembrane testing facility in the world, uh, which I didn't know before. And uh, we carried out a, a series of tests using a large, it's, it's about a 600 millimeter diameter cell, which can take pressures up to two, two and a half MPA. And what we did is we collected <coughs> about six or ten big barrels of, of tailings from Highland Valley Copper here in BC, which would be representative of what we call hard rock tailings. Uh, tailings has a whole spectrum from hard rock to altered rock to fine to ultra fine like in the oil sands. So you have many different types of tailings. So this would probably be representative of most of the metal mines in, in Canada. And we varied the permeability of the tailings over top of the liner. We varied the permeability under the liner. We put in different size holes in the liner. And we also put a hole in a wrinkle, because that's often where you can get a lot more seepage. And, and just to back up a bit, um, the whole use of liners has been, primarily was developed for landfills and for um, heap leach projects. And it just has been applied to tailings as an afterthought. And people use the same ideas and technology of, of lining for a, I mean, of placing liners for a, um, a landfill as they would for a tailings dam, which I'm not in agreement with. But the results of these tests showed that <coughs> really the, the um, seepage through the holes in the liner, well, first of all, it's inflow constrained, but also you got more consolidation around the hole. And surprisingly, the leakage rate was not that, not directly sensitive to the permeability. It was sensitive to permeability, but not, if the permeability of the tailings was 100 times more pervious, you didn't get 100 times more leakage. And you can see, I think, the second line at the bottom there, the average leakage from all of our testing, and it wasn't that far off, was like 0.005 liters per square kilometer. So using conventional QAQC for your liner, if, if, as a geotechnical engineer, that's zero, you know, because you can't, you'd have a hard time measuring that leakage rate. The other area, um, thickened and paste tailings, and I don't know if you've heard about it, but thickened tailings was introduced by Rubinsky in the 70s, and paste tailings about 25 years ago when it came out of putting paste tailings underground. And paste tailings is really just tailings which is thickened enough that um, it behaves more like a, like a mud flow with, with a yield stress similar to a, a mud flow. But the, um, the history of and the success of both thickened and paste, um, I think is sort of a, a record of over promise and under deliver. The theory is you'd get nice steep slopes and not have to build very big dams. But the reality is these slopes are typically less than 2% and not a lot different than if you didn't spend all the money thickening and making the paste. And to my knowledge, I'm not aware of any successful paste project. The one on the, on the bottom left there, that's at Myra Falls. It was one of the first project, paste projects that we did. And uh, you can see it's, it's coming out. You can see water there and it's fairly flattish. Um, the chart that I have up there with all the different colors, that's a chart that we've recently developed with uh, part of our iCold um, work on tailing technologies. And it's just a plot showing uh, percent solids along the base and um, yield stress along the vertical axes. And you go from on the right from a coarse tailings to the left of a ultra fine tailings. And so even with a simple jar settling test, you can you can characterize what kind of tailings you're dealing with. And uh, the boxes there just indicate with a certain type of thickening what yield stress you might be able to get with it. Now the next set of my talk, I just want to cover, give you a summary about what happened at Mount Polly before I lead into some of the outcomes and learnings from Mount Polly. Uh, since 1946, um, the British Columbia government has been keeping records of all tailing dam incidents. And if you go back through those incidents, um, there's really, there's, I, I think I could find about 10 which we would possibly call a dam failure. Uh, most of them had a release of 
less than 10,000 cubic meters. There was one that released 100,000. But Mount Pauly really was the first and the biggest significant uh, tailings dam failure in, in British Columbia's history, uh, releasing something like 22 million cubic meters of tailings in water. The dam itself, it's a four kilometer long U-shaped structure, 40 meters high at the section where it broke. Um, you can see where the, the box that shows the, um, the tailings runout area, the tailings ran out into um, Polly Lake, which was a man-made lake adjacent to the mine, and then down to uh, the bottom there into Quenelle Lake, which is the largest deep water lake in, in Canada. Now the government, uh, pretty well immediately initiated three things. The independent review panel, which I'm sure you've all heard of with Dr. Morgenstern and Steve Vick and Dr. Dirk Van Ziel. The, and their report came out in January 2015. The chief inspector of mines, as part of his, his obligations and duty, uh, initiated an investigation. And thirdly, the conservation office, which is the enforcement arm of the Ministry of Environment, initiated an investigation. And the um, Conservation Office investigation is still in progress. Now the investigation, um, all the data from the site investigation was shared by everybody. Um, I think Brian Watts was telling me what it was like at Mount, not at Mount Polly, in Frelis, where they had four or five different investigations and each one was drilling a hole next to the other one and not sharing any of the information. So we took the step early on that you know, all the data would be out and available to everybody. It's a comprehensive program, at least 22 sonic drills, and then going back in and getting undisturbed samples, cone penetration tests, vein shear tests, extensive laboratory test. The figure there shows the area of the breach. It was about 250 meters. So of this four kilometer dam, that 250 meter section is where we had the weak material. And the shaded area in the middle there is where the thickening was, was over a meter, but typically it was less than a meter and, th and I think the thickest was several meters. This is a cross section of the dam. And it's basically a center line rock fill glacial till core dam. Upstream, they were using a combination of, in some places, tailings, in some places, rock fill, in some places, borer material to provide the support for the upstream uh, upstream support for the core of the dam, and the downstream was rock fill. But this area, like many areas in British Columbia, has a complex geological history. There is at least three glacial periods in here. The first one was the Wisconsin, um, 30, over 34,000 years ago. We were able to date some of the, um, some uh, carbon samples from the lower uh, glacial fluvial layers. And then subsequent uh, glacial things that laid out almost a sandwich and, and a very irregular interspersing of uh, glacial fluvial, glacial lacustrine as you had quiet periods, and then more glacial till units. And is, is in what we call the upper clay unit that the failure was on. There was a lower clay layer, um, which is uh, prevalent across the whole dam site. This upper clay layer was only prevalent in this location. The clay itself, it was um, sort of medium to high plastic. Here you've, on the right there, you've got the, the limits for the upper layer, and, and the, at the bottom you have the, the uh, average limits for the lower layer. And on the bottom left there, you've got the consolidation curves form. The, I think the pre average pre-consolidation pressure for the upper layer was about 400 kPa, and the lower layer was about 750 kPa. And uh, the photo there shows you've got you know, very thin bars of millimeters thick. And the second parallel one is showing the shearing. That was, so that was a sample that was collected under the, or in the failure zone. Uh, I don't expect you to read that, but really the, the failure happened in um, a series. If you looked at the, the drain done shear strength, the factor of safety was in the order of 1.27. When we took into account the construction bore pressures that would, should be accounted for as you load it, and also the, there were some confined glacial fluvial layers, so we had actually some artesian pressures under the dam, the factor of safety reduced to about 1.19. But with the steep slope, you got 
stress concentrations in the toe that moved it to undrained failure and then with a factor of safety of one and then it deformed, I think it moved a maximum of about six meters as it uh, slid on the, on the weak clay layer at the fully remolded strength of 0.8 factor safety and then it rest, came to rest at a factor safety of one. And it was, we had remarkable correlation between the laboratory testing and the modeling and the site programs. Uh, the deformation modeling of it, we carried out 2D plain strain flak analysis to, to, to re-enact um, the, the failure. The two shots on the right just show the uh, pictorially what happens in our option of, or the printout of the model on the bottom left. This failure, it actually happened <coughs> at 11.40, an hour and a half before the breach. Um, the dam failed and there was probably a few liters a second, 10 liters a second, 100 liters a second, 300 liters a second. And then at 110, it let loose. Um, talking to the operators who were at the site, they described it as um, uh, standing uh, right next to Hell's Gate Canyon and listening to the Fraser River roar through. So it was quite a dramatic event. But now, what happens after Mount Polly? And I guess also we've had some Marco since then, and that's put some color into this as well. But the process we took after Mount Polly, uh, one of the main was the uh, Ministry of Mines looked at um, reviewing the mining code, reviewing the regulations. Association of Professional Engineers of BC looked at developing the guideline for site characterization of dam foundations. The Canadian Dam Association uh, improvements to their bulletin, particularly with respect to engineer of record and, and factors of safety. And Mine Owner Governance, uh, Mining Association of Canada is, is re-looking at their guidelines. But I just want to relate a bit on this, on the code. It, it's an important step in British Columbia and it will change um, how we proceed further. Um, we formed a tailing subcommittee which was, there was a main committee and then there was a committee for health and safety and a committee for tailings. And I was chair of the tailings committee with representatives from various groups. But the first step was to review legislation around the world and around Canada. So we got all the regulations from each of the provinces, uh, some of the states, Alaska, Arizona, uh, Montana, South Africa, Australia, Europe. And when you look at it, the conclusion is there's really no good regulation out there for tailing dams. So we thought, well, let's just step back. We'll just start with a clean sheet. What do we want in good practice for tailing dams? Because really the, the idea with regulations, you're not telling people how to design a dam and you want to keep it open to innovation and how we develop, but you want elements of good practice. And those are what we've kind of worked through in, in developing the code. So to a large degree, most of it is not anything that a good practitioner wouldn't do anyway. Some of the key requirements, um, I mean the mine owner is responsible for the dam, it's his dam, there's no question. And he has to take all the care necessary for that. Um, but we have required the mine to appoint, and we've used the term TSF, Tailing Storage Facility Qualified Person, because um, it's clarity of accountability. So that person is the person at the mine who is responsible for assuring dam safety. <clears throat> Likewise, on the engineering side, the terminology of engineer record, which really hasn't been in the lexicon of tailing dam design over, over historically. But again, it's saying, well, okay, well who, is, who is worrying about the structure? And that's really the role of the engineer of record, to understand the structure understand uh, any changes to the structure, understand how it's being operated, so that from a professional design point of view, he can assure that the dam is being designed to, to uh, current practice, meets all regulations and guidelines. Um, all tailing dams are required to have an independent review board now, and the review board is really just a check and balance on the engineer. That's its main purpose and it helps inform the mining company whether they're getting um, reasonable advice and whether they're going in the right direction. 
but some people wanted the review board to be reporting to government and to have it all public as they do in Montana. And we push back on that. And it's really only if there's issues of dam safety that the um, communication from the review board has to go to the government. Uh, annual inspections is normal. Well, actually by the engineer record. Uh, dam safety reviews now will be every five years for dams. Whereas in water dams and the Canadian Dam Association guidelines, they can be from five to 10, depending on the consequence classification. We also established a few minimum criteria, and this is somewhat to protect the engineers from themselves. Um, factor are slopes of two horizontal to one vertical. And this one, you know, if, if you have rock fill on rock on bedrock, you can't apply to have a steeper slope. But the minimum design criteria for flood and seismic uh, will be equivalent to a high classification of CDA. And that's because the environmental consequences of a tailings release are not the same as the environmental consequences of a water dam. And there's another other factors in there and I won't go into them today, so I encourage you to read the regulations. Practice guidelines, um, the uh, APEG BC introduced a very good practice guideline on dam safety reviews in 2013. And the Canadian Dam Association has um, issued one uh, this year, just last month, I think. But these practice guidelines are, are, are to set the framework of what's expected for good practice. It's not telling you how to design a dam or how to do something. But the standard of care that the engineer has to carry out when doing a dam safety review and now doing a site characterization for the foundation of a dam is outlined in, this, in, in these guidelines. And if something happens, if you can show, no, I followed the standard of care of the guidelines, then you know, that is your legal protection. But it sets a more level bar for what is the standard practice of care. And I mentioned the Canadian Dam Association. Mine owner governance, certainly after these failures, um, there's been a lot more uh, discussion and involvement of mining companies and uh, requirements for dam safety reviews. And I think you know, in the last year, the, uh, every major mining company is looking at each of their dams. But the Mining Association of Canada, they have these guidelines, but the, the challenges from the mining side is getting all the mines to, to uh, use and implement these guidelines and, and also to um, in a transparent and independent audit process for them. Now, best available technology, and this is an area where um, certainly it has had a lot of press. The, um, one of the panel recommendations was that best available technology is filtered tailings and, uh, or, or drained or, or um, compacted tailings, which you would have to filter to get to that state for most tailings. And it's the idea that, yeah, we can produce something that has no risk. And like society, we don't want any risk. We want everything on a plate for us. And so everybody says, well, you have to do filtered tailings now. But filtered tailings, um, there's no question, it can reduce the physical risk of a structure. But you have to think about the context of filtered tailings. There are risk of environment with the uh, sulfides and acid rock drainage, and those are not insignificant. But also with cost, um, you take a, a porphyry copper mine where you're mining uh, millions of tons a year. The value of that tailings with respect to the ore you produce might only be $15. You take a high-grade underground gold mine or, go or any under high grade deposit or a gold mine, the value of that tailings in terms of mineral or money produced can be $250. So applying filtered tailings economically from a $250 tailing to a $15 tailing, there's significant challenges because the cost of, of filtering is, it can be five or $10 a ton. So you're, for some of these porphyry copper mines, you'd be spending 50% of your cost just on tailings. But also, you know, tailings, when they go in the impoundment, they, they, they naturally consolidate to a density of similar to a, like a 
pace tailings just by natural consolidation. So we have to think about are we spending all this energy and money to, to get tailings to a different state where um, naturally it would get to that state anyway. And it, it's interesting, um, that quote at the bottom, it was from Earl Clone in 1977 where filter tailings might be the future of tailing dams. So filter tailings has been with us a long time and, and for many applications, it's a very good sound solution. But like all of our technologies, all of our situations, they're all different and no size fits all. Every project has to be looked at its own merits and, and requirements. We have in the code that um, you do have to carry out assessments of, of um, best available technologies of all the technologies and all your alternatives, which is appropriate. Uh, we recently did a project where instead of having a 250 meter high conventional tailings dam with a filtered pile, we had a 400 meter high filtered pile and 150 meter high water dam. So there you're changing the risk profile of what you're doing. And that's why you can't just latch on to the sounds to be the best solution. You have to work through each one from the engineering basis. Oops, I'm a little fast, aren't I? Uh, my concluding remarks. Most tailing dams are designed and constructed well. But these recent inter incidents that we've had, and they've, they've pushed government to introduce uh, regulation. And in some ways, it's taking um, uh, it out of the professional practice guideline, or out of professional practice, and it's being put into regulations. If these regulations are the law, that's, you have to do them now. And I don't disagree because there are good practice procedures, but it is that philosophy of it's, it's being regulated because as professionals, we haven't been able to, to um, ensure that our design and management of these facilities is, is meeting safe practice. And we, um, you know, the design and management of them, we, we have the technology and knowledge to design structures. Um, there's no reason why we can't. Um, but there are um, concerns with how things change over time. And the design of a tailings dam is very different than a water dam for that reason, because it's always changing over the life of the mine. And certainly the revision of the mining code will help um, in terms of putting in the perspective of what's considered good practice and the regulators will be following that. But I guess the, the sort of the one thing that I want to leave you with is that as tailing dam designers, we're not really designing tailing dams. We're designing landforms. These structures are going to be here for a thousand years plus. And we have to be thinking about how this structure is going to transition into what I like to call a landform. And certainly the, in the code now, I think the, originally we had, um, when you get a mine permitted, it has to be a conceptual design for closure. And we've changed that to, you know, you have to have more definition of what is your closure design. Because to me, that's, that's an area of risk that um, we haven't faced yet. Um, the reality is um, there should be more tailing dam failures when I look at the state of practice around the world, and there probably aren't more tailing dam failures because a lot haven't been tested by seismic or flood events. And so this thinking of designing structures that are sustainable, that are robust, that um, are simple, that uh, there's less to go wrong with them, leaves us a better future in terms of uh, structures that can be sustainable and uh, will not be a burden to future societies, which is really the definition of sustainability. Um, acknowledgement, so first of all, I do have to thank uh, Clone Crip and Berger. It's 42 years with them, and certainly the support over 42 years has been very good. And uh, historical contributions, Cyril Lenoff, and Cyril passed away this year, but he's a real historian and some of um, his, his writings over the years in terms of the history of um, engineering in Canada are, are fantastic. And some of the information from his, um, his writings I've used here today. Fred Maddich contributed the, uh, his papers on the first geotechnical assessment at uh, 
at Copper Cliff, and certainly Carrie Rowey on this line of research. And we continue doing line of research. We're currently doing one with um, looking at piping through holes in the liner. And we're also uh, looking at doing one on longevity of liners. And I have to tell you a little anecdote because we, we put in an application to the Canadian government for a, a research project on aging of liners, uh, I think two years ago now. And some of the letters re of rejection came back to us. And one said, well, we're not gonna have tailings anymore, so why are we bothering with liners? <laughs> Which when you're in British Columbia and you're gonna be producing five billion tons of tailings, it, you know, we are going to have tailings if we want to have metals. And the second one was, well, liners are perfect. Why would you do any research on liners? So I think this thinking of, no, uh, we do have to do research. We do have to be thinking about how we're going to improve what we're doing and move forward. And certainly the, the Ministry of Energy and Mines, the um, site investigation team, it was uh, a pretty uh, intense year and a half going through every piece of information and interviews and developing the root causes of the failure and understanding what happened at Mount Pauly was um, a good experience for myself and also it was a learning experience for the ministry in terms of what is required and the ministry is changing a lot of how they're doing things and how they will be um, monitoring and also um, roles and responsibilities of their own inspectors. And certainly the Mining Code Review Committee, um, I'm not sure if any are here today, but putting together the code, it was a lot of work and a lot of um, figuring out as to, because it has to be cleanly written and has to be um, accountable. And the APEG BC Guideline Committee and the tailing, CDA Tailing Man Committee. And lastly, old Alex here for reviewing and uh, giving the support throughout this. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Harvey, for a, a great talk. I've worked with Harvey for over 35 years, and one of his well-known attributes is that he's hard to find. <laughs> Last week, he was in Kazakhstan, and even at the table down here, as we were talking about um, his lecture, he, he was trying to convince me to go to uh, the DRC next <laughs> month, but I think he's going. Um, really, uh, Harvey at our firm is a, is a successor to Earl Clone and takes forward the, the history of that engineering design and tailings dam practice. Harvey gave us a brief trip through the history of tailings dam engineering in, in Canada, and as he said, the application of engineering principles to tailings dam design really started in Western Canada with Earl Cologne and Hard Rock Mining and Chuck Bronner and Bob Hardy in, in the oil sands. And in Eastern Canada with, with Fred Maddich. Uh, Fred is going to be here this week. I don't know if he's in the audience, but uh, a couple of weeks ago I was at uh, this M area South Dam with him. Uh, and he started with the client in 1956 and the client at the closing meeting noted that he had been on the job for 60 years, 60 years. Earlier this year, he did a loop and a Spitfire and he's the only guy I know uh, with a Bren gun carrier and a flamethrower that works. But anyway, if Fred is here, <laughs> you should talk to him this week. Um, Harvey, thanks very much for your description of the Mount Pauly failure. Um, and just to be clear, there was an independent expert review panel of Nordy Morgenstern, uh, Steve Vick, and uh, uh, Dirk Van Zeel from UBC. But uh, Harvey led the parallel effort which had to be done by the Ministry of Mines. And technically, they came to the, to the same conclusions. But uh, Harvey's group um, had to look hard at the root causes. And so Harvey spent a lot of time in interviews uh, with all the mine personnel and of everyone, he he knows this this failure. Um, he knows this failure intimately. Um, as a result of that, he uh, was asked to be the chair of this mining code, and and it really represents a big step because 
we, we're going from a self-regulated to a regulated industry now. And thank goodness it was Harvey who was the chair of that, but we're going to see mandatory, no steeper than two to one slope, 72 hour uh, IDFs in British Columbia going forward. So he gave us um, a glimpse into the rapidly evolving changes, changes in tailings dram practice uh, going forward. But he also let us know that uh, we have a responsibility to society and what we're doing is designing sustainable landforms. And we thank you for that, Harvey. And on behalf of the CGS and in Bob Hardy's name, I would like you to present you with this certificate and a gift. Everyone, Harvey McLeod. Thank you, Brian, for this wonderful uh, word of thanks for Harvey McLeod. And uh, I'm, just, I'm just here to give you some announcement, practical uh, things to keep in mind. One is the uh, parallel technical sessions will start sharp on schedule after each break. The first uh, break, uh, the, the first breakout sessions for this morning will start at 10.30. Uh, you will hear probably the CGS bell that will urge you to stop whatever you're doing and uh, run to the technical sessions. Now, the other uh, reminder, Andrea mentioned it already, but um, if you are not planning on attending the local color night or the CGS award banquet, please uh, donate your uh, tickets to the um, student delegates. And you can do that by dropping off your tickets at the registration desk. And as Andrea said, the student delegates will be pleased to use your tickets on your behalf. Thank you very much. And this closes this session. So next is the break. Thank you.